Hello everyone, it's me, Martimus. As you can see, we're looking at one of the most ridiculous, yet amazing, armored fighting vehicles I've ever come across. Recently I did a video on the Object 490, a Russian prototype tank, which was never produced. And what you're looking at right now is one of the greatest, I would say, almost the best creations of Russian armor I've ever seen in my entire life. Once I did a bit of research on prototype Russian vehicles from the 490, I started looking into the other realms of what they've produced, and my god, were my eyes opened to see on what they've produced in the past. This is the Mendeliev tank. I call it a tank, but it should be much rather classified as a battleship with tracks on it. It was never produced, it was a prototype vehicle, and as you can see by the way it's been designed, they really didn't focus on the key factors or aspects of armored fighting vehicles back then, other than firepower. <laughs> and the Russians, you can kind of see where they played upon this design throughout the rest of history, you know, bigger guns, heavier armor, big, fat, chunky beasts. Um, you know, over time they've refined and, and defined even armored fighting vehicles to the point of, you know, very, very good weaponry that they're using today. But this thing, <laughs> when I first saw it, I couldn't stop giggling to myself. But the same instance, I'm like, you know what? This thing deserves some input to the channel. It deserves some spotlight and some heads up as to what it's all about. So we're going to talk about it a little bit today as a bit of an overview because I think it sh it deserves every ounce of respect and uh, attention. So the Mendeleev tank was named after its designer, Vasily Mendeleev, and after the town in which the first drawings of the vehicle were introduced to the Russian Imperial Army officials. From 1903 until 1906, he worked in a shipbuilding department, ironically, of the Kronstadt Institute of the Naval Engineering and at the shipyards at Petersburg until 1916. His background sure showed in his designs when the, quote, armored land cruiser, unquote, he proposed in 1915 used heavy armored plating, evidently that used on warships, 150 millimeters to 100 millimeters thick, an engine from a bloody submarine, the whole thing had a vague submarine-ish look anyway, and a 120mm naval gun. So the Russians were well, well ahead of their time with their guns. They actually put a 120mm gun in at World War One. We're still trying to put in 120mm guns today. Note, however, that this gun had not a rigid mount, and has been put forward by some a modern recoil system. I would be fascinated to see how it works. The whole system, though, was found to be inside of the tank. It was very big, as you can see. It was huge. It weighed 170 tons, making it one of the biggest armored fighting vehicles ever proposed. It would have been heavier than the German 150-ton K-Wagon. It would have also served a crew of eight. The tank, unfortunately, never left the drawing table. It was intended as a game changer on the eastern front of World War I. Can you imagine hundreds of these things charging over the trenches with that gun pointing front? I would just run away in, in fear of it. I mean, it's just insane. Absolutely insane. Much better armored than its German counterpart, of course. It used its own steel plates for protection. It was designed with a revolutionary gas suspension system and a high-powered petrol engine. Believe me, you're going to need a high-powered petrol engine for this thing. The thing that terrifies me with petrol engines is they catch fire very, very easily. And as you can see in this steel armored box, a fire just isn't going to go well. You're basically turning your vehicle into an oven. A unique device was invented to enable the tank to move independently on railway tracks, basically turning it into a railway gun. The project received very little support, and Mendeleev tried to construct the tank on his own single-handedly. What a boss. You know what? No one wants to take my design? I'm believing it so much, I'm going to build it myself. The lack of interest by the government prevented him from doing so, and the tank remained nothing more than a series of drawings and plans, unfortunately, which you're seeing in this video. The gas suspension actually eased the travel of the vehicle when it was on the move. And of course, when this thing is on the move, weighing close to 170 tons, it's a lot of weight to move around, and you can see that the suspension is going to struggle no matter how much you try and move it around. And ease of travel, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. But interestingly, it also allowed for the vehicle to move in a hull half lowered and even completely lowered to the ground when stopped, if necessary. The idea was that full or partial lowering of the hull would protect the most vulnerable part of the machine. The running gear, which I've done a video on in the past, 
And this is actually one of the smartest ideas I've ever seen in tank concepts. Something that can turn itself into a standpoint bunker by protecting its tracks, putting all of its armor around itself, picking itself up again and going. I think that's actually a really smart move, especially back in those days where artillery was inherently key. Uh, Anti-tank artillery for sure. All you'd have to do is put a couple of well-placed HE on those tracks. It's done. It's not going anywhere. Then it is literally a pillbox or a bunker. Uh, and that gun at the front, it's not traversing anywhere. It's pointing probably 40 to maybe 50 degrees left and right, up and down, and that's about it. So you're kind of pooched. So it's actually really smart of an idea to have this thing lower to the ground up and down with this sort of hydrogenomatic or hydraulic suspension system. Because it's protecting the key things, which I have said many times in the past, is the running gear of any tank. The calculated speed of this monster was an impressive 22 to 24 kilometers an hour. Which would have been good if it was ever realized. It would be absolutely incredible to see a 170 tons worth of steel with that gun coming out the front traveling at 24 kilometers an hour. There'd be nothing greater other than watching a Bob Semple be run over by this thing. I think that would be one of the greatest, greatest tank things to ever see in my entire life. An obvious drawback that can be seen in many early tank designs is the configuration of the front of the tracks giving a very poor climbing capacity. Basically, the tracks were just wrapped around the wheels totally. There was no um, bogey or sprocket or idler. It was just a straight runner around all the wheels, which allows it absolutely no climbing capability. It will just hit on the wheel and get stuck, which is very similar to that of cars if they're not given the right amount of tire pressure, etc, etc. Had it actually ever been used, it would probably have suffered the exact same fate as many of the French tanks in its day. It would have just got stuck. The trench crossing capability and capacity would have been nearly, well, almost nil. However, one of the benefits of this kind of suspension is that it was remarkably able to retract it all inside itself, as I said before. The road wheels were mounted on the pneumatic suspension systems that could just lower the whole damn thing to the ground, turning it into a static blockhouse. All these pneumatic devices were provided with necessary quantities of compressed air with the aid of a special compressor driven by the engine of the tank inside. Four operating posts were provided, which allowed any of the members of the crew to operate the machine, in case the driver was wounded or killed. Almost near impossible amount of armor and the speed of this thing is going 24 k's an hour. How is any gunner meant to track that thing on an anti-tank weapons platform? In case the driver was wounded or killed, the steering apparatus could actually be changed between position position to allow them to keep moving. There were plans to making a second variant of the Mendeleev tank, but only sketchy data is known, and it's really difficult to find any information on this thing. It's supposed to have an even larger gun with a caliber of up to 127mm, which is even beating the modern day standard of the 125mm gun that we see on most Russian tanks today. It also had two machine gun turrets instead of the one, plus an armor add-on of an additional 50mm, bringing it up to 200mm of armor plate thickness. But was it really necessary to protect the machine with so much armor? And to arm it with such a large caliber gun in 1911? Tanks of World War I were protected much more poorly, and the caliber of tank guns did not exceed 75mm. Mendeleev's tank could not really be seen as a tank properly, but more of a mobile artillery position? Or a really big self-propelled gun? Maybe the first of all self-propelled guns that could have hit the battlefield. But for the main purpose of what it was designed for, it was not going to be able to do what it asked. It was not designed to take on trenches, it would have been great at destroying fortifications, but by the time it got there, it would have been absolutely pulverized by artillery. In other words, it was thought as a bit of a gigantic bunker buster, and this idea would later surface in the form of an unpractical but impressive KV-2. It could not really be used as a tank due to its limited mobility, however, all this does not belittle the merits of the talented Russian engineer V.D. Mendeleev. His project was a truly original work which contained a number of truly courageous and innovative features, and some of them have still been realized later on in today's Russian tank arsenal. So, you know, I must admit, I have a lot of respect for this guy. He's gone all out, he's put every chip in, he's like, I'm going for it, I'm just going to go crazy with this thing, let's see what they put up with. They didn't put up with any of it, um, they threw it straight in the garbage, which is unfortunate. If they just built one or two of them, can you just imagine these things, though? I would love to see that gun firing, a, you know, 125 or 127mm gun on 170 tons of steel, rolling around on straight, flat road-wheel drive gears that can drop to the ground and lift up again, turning it into a basically mobile fortification. 
I love it. I absolutely love it. I would love to hear your opinion on this, folks. Please leave me a comment in the comment section below. If I did get anything wrong, well, I apologize. It's very hard to find much information on this thing. Uh, if you liked the video, please hit the little uh, thumb button there. I would really appreciate it. All the usual YouTube cliches. Uh, if you want to see any future content from my channel, I'd really appreciate you hit the little bell button. By the subscribe button so you can be notified next time of new videos coming out. Definitely going to be looking at more Russian prototypes or potentially all sorts of countries prototype tanks in the future and doing more of these kind of videos. I know you guys have been enjoying them so hopefully I'll be able to do some more. If you've been supporting my Patreon page, thank you so much for doing so. You're really helping me. In fact, today I actually uh, purchased a new Logitech uh, high definition webcam to be able to do better live streaming with you guys and podcasts and all that sort of stuff and vlogs so we can sort of interact with each other with crystal clear vision um and you know it's really appreciated for those who have been donating and supporting that page so thank you so much if you wish to see any of my social media or links in the description box below you can just uh that goes my kajiji just bleeped i mean that's interesting um you're more than welcome to check out the description box below and i hope you all have a wonderful day i'll see you on the next one folks Bye bye